Good morning, and welcome to Samuel Associates Policy Insights Forum. I am Paul Tyon, Samuel Associates Academic Advisor. Today, our focus is on the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the strategic and operational implications for NATO and Canada. To do this, I have called upon two notable persons to address the issue and the questions surrounding the topic. Lieutenant General Andrew Leslie and Mr. Joe Varner. Before we begin, I would like to uh, formally introduce our two guests. Lieutenant General, the Honorable Andrew Leslie, uh, commanded and led 57,000 personnel in the Canadian Armed Forces in fires, floods, earthquakes, security missions, peacekeeping and war in Cyprus, Germany, Afghanistan and elsewhere being awarded numerous national and international honors and decorations. He's also been a senior vice president to a very large multinational corporation, a federal member of parliament, the chief governing whip, the, the parliamentary secretary focused on Canada-US relations and trade during the time of NAFTA and was included on several federal cabinet committees. He sits on various corporate boards with expertise in leadership, governance, mentoring and succession planning and crisis response. He was educated at the Ottawa University, the Royal Military College, and was recently conferred an honorary doctorate at the Royal Military College. He has also undertaken courses at various military staff colleges and has been a student at Harvard Business School and the Rothman School of Business. Mr. Joe Varner, is an adjunct scholar at West Point's Modern War Institute and is author of Canada's Asia Pacific Security Dilemma. He served as senior advisor and director of policy to the Minister of National Defense and the Minister of Justice and the Attorney General of Canada, the Honorable G. Peter McKay from 2008 to 2014. Mr. Varner also served as a faculty member with the American Military University specializing in teaching Homeland Security and Intelligence Studies. He is also a fellow of Inter-University Seminar on Armed Forces and Society, the Royal Society of Arts, Royal Asiatic Society of the United Kingdom in Northern Ireland, and he is a member of the International Institute of Strategic Studies and the Royal United Services Institute of Defense Studies in London. Mr. Varner is also a past senior a research fellow of the Canadian Institute of Strategic Studies, research fellow of the Conference of Defense Associations, the Naval Officers Association of Canada, and has also been a published uh, uh, author at the Macdonald Laurier Institute, the Mackenzie Institute, and the Heritage Foundation. Mr. F Mr. Varner is a commander of the most venerable order of the Hospital of St. John of Jerusalem, and was awarded the Canadian Forces Medallion for Distinguished Service and two command commendations. In his military career, he served as a platoon commander, intelligence officer, assistant adjutant, and company second in command with the West Nova Scotia Regiment. A native of Nova Scotia, Mr. Varner has a BA Honours in International Relations, an MA in Political Science from Acadia, and has undertaken doctoral work at the Henley Putnam College. National American University in Strategic Security. Gentlemen, I would like to turn to the situation that we are facing in uh, Ukraine. The war has been going on for nearly one month. Can we make any assessments as to the Russian army's capability to date? General. Thank you, Paul. Uh, yes. Um, I think uh, Putin has uh, vastly overestimated his prowess as a strategic commander. What Russian in their right mind would order an attack on the Ukraine? Point one. Point two is why on earth would they order it just at the commencement of the rainy season when the plateaus and farming terrain of the Ukraine turns to a thick mud? Don't forget, Napoleon found out about this and so did Hitler and a variety of other invaders throughout the centuries. Uh, thirdly, he has badly overestimated the capabilities of his generals to synchronize all aspects of the combined arms team, air, land, and sea forces. He's also overestimated the prowess of his own troops and their equipment, 
and he's underestimated the ability of NATO to pull together when faced with such a threat. What he did not overestimate, in other words, he was correct in his estimate, was that NATO was not prepared. So he thought he could win. He decided to go in and Ukraines are putting up a valiant defense. There's a good argument to be made that after almost a month, uh, the first echelon of his attacking forces, which have been canalized into essentially sticking to the main roads, because we all know what thousands of track vehicles can do to a mud trail, um, has culminated. Doesn't mean they've lost, but essentially they now have to rethink that which it is they're doing and figure out what other strategic direction they're going to conduct in the continuance of the, of the mission that Putin has assigned to them. I believe that the casualties and the maintenance on the vehicles and the resupply efforts of the Russians has been um, very shoddy so far. I believe that uh, they are essentially pausing to uh, let uh, negotiations buy them some time while they can rearm and as well repopulate some of the severely depleted units in their first echelon, which essentially are combat complete in the sense that they're of no particular value or use. Of note, so far, most of the vehicles that we've seen have been T-72s, for example, in terms of the main battle tanks, commensurate with the first echelon, mainly of conscripts, not exclusively. In the second echelon, more and more T-80s are showing up, uh, and as is the heavier artillery pieces. So all in all, an unimpressive campaign so far, and uh, quite a adroit and agile defense by the Ukrainians. Mr. Varner, you've uh, studied the Soviet army and uh, contemporary Russian army. There's some issues uh, relating to the question of Russian military leadership. Can you make a uh, comment on that? What I would say is that, that Russian military leadership is really, well, you don't see leadership or decision-making below the Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel rank. Um, and we're seeing that on the battlefield, you know, light, light Ukrainian units running around the battlefield, killing tanks, showing a considerable degree of tactical prowess and the Russians sticking to battle drills and, 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 you know, making lots of what I would call operational art mistakes that they're not supposed to make. They're penny packeting their battalion tactical groups as they attack uh, built up areas. So, you know, they use the first guards tank army for a frontal assault on uh, uh, Kharkiv. Uh, you know, these are odd sort of things to do. You know, a month in, they still don't have air superiority. Uh, so you're seeing what I think is a reluctance uh, on, on the part of junior leaders, if there are any, uh, a lack of knowledge, a lack of initiative, uh, a lack of aggressiveness, and you're seeing actually a fairly high body count in terms of general officers, colonels, and, and, and above who seem to be out there trying to lead from the front and trying to break through. So I think I, I would say that they have a real serious leadership problem. The one thing I would say, though, in the south, uh, the southern military district uh, commander is a, 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 a Colonel General um, Dvork, uh, and he actually is doing fairly well compared to the other uh, armies, uh, army groups that are assembled. And I would say that he's probably a future either defense minister or a, a future chief of general staff. So as you pointed out, on the tactical level, the Russian troops do not seem to be essentially well-trained or prepared or well-led. But there seems to be a wide disparity between the Russian troops in the north and the south. Uh, General, can you account for this? My belief is that um, the uh, Russian attackers coming up from the Crimea have, are in the main professional forces. Whereas the initial first echelon and the lead elements perhaps of the second have been mainly conscripts. Of course, it's it, throughout you have the uh, NCOs and the officers who, um, who uh, are quote professional. Um, I, would, um, I would also point out that the troops coming up from the south um, appear to be um, much more aggressive and that is perhaps a function of leadership. Uh, and um, as well, the terrain that they're dealing with 
is probably not as complex in terms of the mud and the canalizing effect of perhaps illogical resupply lines and choices there too. Uh, and as well, perhaps, I mean, the quality of the defenders throughout the Ukraine has been nothing less than magnificent, but it appears to be much more um, um, positional, if you would, in the initial stages to the east, whereas uh, down south, it was uh, fairly clear cut that they had to go you know, to the west to do the link up with the Russian forces advancing from the east and limited penetrations and gains to the north and in their case, east. It, it was reported that... Uh... You know, the Russians have uh, invested heavily in modernizing the Russian armed forces. Uh, in your view, Joe, is, has this investment been a failure? I don't think so. I mean, I think they have invested heavily in, in their armed forces, and I think that they've done a fairly good job of modernizing what was a, was an old army um, and, and air force and, and navy. And, you know, the navy's probably struggling still a bit, but submarine forces are coming along. Uh, strategic air is in a good spot. I think the general alluded to it. What's what's interesting is not just are the, 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 that they're probably conscript troops that they used in that first echelon, but the troops that came from the north all were pulled out of the far eastern military district. So those troops that marched on that that Belarus to Kiev access or access all came out of the far east. And probably, probably not the highest readiness point of, of the Russian military. And those people that are, can, that are moving from, from Russia on to uh, Kiev uh, from the east, or, they actually were from the central military district. Again, not a high readiness organization in the Russian military. The general's dead on. In the south, they're professionals. They, they're hard to organize. Uh, the the crew that are right now the the axis that's going after uh, Russia to uh, Kharkiv are uh, Western military district troops. These guys all go through the stress test of Zapad uh, in a big way. Russian military does in in other areas. They have smaller exercises, but it's the Western military district and the Southern military district that's the bulk of their their combat power. And that's that's where their their hard edged forces are, um, and so in in a sense, I think that this has a lot more to do with with the personnel and the leadership than it does the equipment. But and if I can just segue a bit here on 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 the, uh, your query, I, I would uh, it would appear that the Russian intelligence uh, as to the Ukrainian ability to resist was ill-informed. Uh, what was your view on that, Joe? I took that to be a mix of probably politicization of intelligence, uh, cognitive dissonance, and some very hard-edged views that are, are in the general uh, Russian population and even in the elite about Ukraine, its place in the world, and its people. Um, and some of the stuff that we're seeing come out in terms of phone conversations that have been monitored and comments are, are very concerning. The Duma passed a decree uh, which talked about hanging traitors in public spaces. I mean, that's, that's more of a German approach to maintaining order than it is a Russian approach. Uh, uh, but it's, it's, it's concerning... In, in how they look at the, the Ukrainians. And I, I think that shaped their intelligence and I think they're paying a price for it. Uh, General, Russian forces reportedly this morning had suffered 10,000 dead, according to uh, Moscow. Uh, these are serious losses. And it looks like they appeared to have uh, deployed 100% of their invasion force uh, and are now fully deployed. What next moves could Russia make? We're currently lead elements around the Ukraine capital, and they have not encircled it, but they are in the outskirts. Um, interestingly, are starting to dig in to what looks like uh, defensive positions in the classic Russian style, uh, which points to either those forces being declared as cumulating. In other words, they, they can go no further and they're waiting for other forces behind them to pass through or else they're deliberately settling in for a longer period to resupply, re-equip, and repopulate uh, 
uh, they're, they're, they're fighting echelons. I would say that the intelligence system that the Russians have, which over the past decades, we've all been trained as professional soldiers to think of it as, as amazing and very powerful. Um, it's, it's been solely lacking. And I think that the Ukraine decision cycles are much more nimble. I think their generals are much more, um, much more focused and as well, better using the skill sets of their troops, both the professionals and those who are you know, civilians four short weeks ago. And there appears to be a great deal of initiative being demonstrated by local Ukraine forces as compared to the Russian monolith, which is what we were always expecting to see. So a fairly rigid sense of discipline and tactics with very little initiative allowed. Quite frankly, that's what we're seeing, which accounts for in part, a very large number of casualties because they're told, go down the road and don't stop. Well, they go down the road and they die. There's something else that's starting to emerge as well. This is not confirmed, but it's on some of the professional chat nets by people who are in contact with those in Ukraine. Very little medical support organization have been seen tucked in behind the lead Russian elements, or even indeed 20, 30, 40, 50 kilometers back. So that means a lot of Russian young men and women are dying because in the first golden hour of them being wounded, they couldn't get into professional medical care. Uh, whereas the Ukraine forces can take advantage of the fact that they're local and they can actually go to just about any facility that's still open or available and have their, have their troops treated. Um, and the third point is that um, the Russians don't seem to give Kazovac any sort of priority in terms of allocation of helicopters. Uh, or indeed vehicles with designated uh, sort of casualty evacuation routes. Um, and their troops are dying as a result of that mismanagement by their leadership. Uh, on that note, uh, could you just make a comment? Uh, has this been a, essentially a failure in sequencing in the Russian invasion plan? I would say they were vastly optimistic in their initial projections of time and space. Um, I also think that they vastly overestimated um, essentially their capabilities in terms of Ukraine. Uh, failure, yes. It's, I mean, you, the, the evidence is irrefutable. Having said that, um, they're still there. And they still, because they are the aggressor and because they're engaging in terror tactics against mainly now the cities of Ukraine with artillery and cruise missile strikes, it's... it's um, it's, it's exhausting and demoralizing to the Ukraine residents who are literally seeing their families die around them mm -hmm. uh, thanks to the barbaric acts of the Russian troops. So I don't want to presume that the Russian bear is uh, neutralized or is still not the savage threat that it's always been. Joe, can you make comment on, uh, has Putin miscalculated in invading Ukraine? Yeah, I think he's miscalculated on invading Ukraine. I think in the sense that that his strategic objective is to seize the whole country, uh, you know, and he hasn't done that. He's now entered the second phase of, of the war, which is a campaign right now of attrition. I think he thought that the Russian army was the German army of, you know, 1941 and that he could roll through the steps and, and, uh, you know, seize the place rather quickly. And the fact of the matter is, he's still stuck with the old Russian army steamroller. Um, you know, and it takes a long time for it to grind grind up into high speed and and to uh, start to to roll over its, its opponents. But it does that by attrition and by weight of numbers. And he launched this campaign with probably about a three to one ratio over his opponent. And that's a very rough ratio in some some components of of equipment and and people. You know, for a good offensive operation, you usually look at five to one. And if you get into built up areas, you're looking at six to one. Used to be the old NATO standard, and and we're not seeing that from Russian forces. He certainly knew that NATO wouldn't stand up, and and NATO gave him all kinds of symbol uh, signals that it wouldn't stand up, and. And, and now everybody's running around, wringing their hands and sucking air through their teeth, trying to decide what they're going to do. Um, he certainly underestimated uh, the Western ability to pull together and hit him with sanctions. And the economic sanctions, it hasn't deterred him or, or stopped him, but it's, it's pinching in Russia. 
And it's certainly got the Chinese attention. They're looking at this now and saying, no, we're not so sure we want to go that route. Uh, and, and you're seeing a bit of a distance between China and Russia. So, you know, did he gather right on, on NATO? Yes. Did he gather right on Ukraine? Uh, no, I don't think so. And I mean, they're fighting extraordinarily well. All that training that Canadian forces and, and NATO have done over the years from, from 2014 is paying off. And, and you're seeing it on, on the battlefield. Um, you know, the Russians fought the M-Law and the M-Law won. Um, and you're, you're, you know, Javelin's become the largest distributor of T-72 parts in the, in the world. Did he make the right decision? It's part of a long train of decisions. He hasn't been deterred by pressure. We didn't see, you know, not in, not in Georgia, not in Chechnya, and and not in Crimea uh, or or the Donbass or now now in in Ukraine, uh, he's got a plan, and and we don't quite frankly. Uh, that you alluded to a, an issue of of interest to me, General. Ukrainian forces have been to date quite successful against uh, numerically superior Russian invasion forces. What do you predicate their success upon? I would say, first of all, inspired leadership in starting with the president, but also being demonstrated by every mayor that I've seen of the major cities, by local uh, influencers, be they people just out of their teens or grizzled veterans of previous wars, by business leaders, and by people literally being willing to fight and die to protect their families, um, all sort of, if you would, inculcated with a sense of uh, initiative and uh, this cheerful optimism, which uh, appears in every video that I've seen of Ukraine combat troops and those who support them. I, I honestly believe that the Ukraine feel that this is winnable, perhaps not in the short term, uh, but uh, it certainly they seem to sort of embrace that idea of a longer term activity. I think it also helped that their um, their response was to get uh, the non combatants out of the way of the fighting as quickly as possible in large numbers. And though that's tragic beyond belief, at least those people are currently safe. Um, and I think as well, the idea of getting international assistance void their morale, sort of act as a good, a good uh, urge to them, a surge of energy, if you would. Of course, as time goes on and the lack of what some of the things they've asked for from NATO doesn't show up, uh, that will have an impact on their morale to the negative. And so will the drying mud because that will give the Russian forces more opportunity to maneuver. Uh, and of course, they have, because they choose the point of attack, they can have local superiority uh, when they do so. Uh, supplementary to that, General, it would appear that the Ukrainian army is prepared to move to a, an insurgency should they be overrun by the Russian army. Could NATO support this or should they? Your views? I think we should do all that we can to support the Ukraine. Keeping in mind that, uh, as my distinguished colleague Joe Werner uh, identified, NATO was not ready for the Russian attack. And that's something that we should talk about and ask our political leaders within NATO and within our own nations, why weren't we ready? Why weren't the clear signs of a, an invasion accepted or understood? Where was the leaning forward in terms of troop deployments to essentially act as a deterrent to Putin, who's solely to blame for all of this, but a contributing factor to his decision might have been, as he spent four and a half months building his force up from zero to 200,000, he could look to the eastern flank of NATO and not see any response, which might cause him to pause. So there was no forward deployment of anti-aircraft systems, no or deployment of aircraft to airfields, which could actually intervene, should it be required. So here we are. Um, and I think that yes, uh, should it get to a counterinsurgency, I'm sure that NATO nations will do all that they can to support. 
Um, it's going to be extraordinarily difficult and complex for the Ukraine to have that degree of cohesion, which they're currently demonstrating. But that might well be the next phase of war. Uh, and I'm interested, well, as we all are, to see just what sort of options NATO will develop in the near future, especially the result of the meetings this week. Uh, the Ukraine has been employing uh, Bayraktar drones to demolish Russian equipment. The drones are slow and they fly low to the ground and have taken out tanks and personnel vehicles by dropping laser-guided bombs. Does Canada have the same capability, Joe? That's a little outside of my realm. What I would say is, you know, we 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 have not had uh, armed drones in the past. We've had sort of reconnaissance drones, but I, that's probably a better question for the general than me. Um, and I don't mean to hand off like that, but I know that there are some options that are coming up in that regard. I mean, we saw a replay of this uh, just some months ago when we saw the Armenians go at it with the uh, Azerbaijanis, and the Azerbaijanis uh, were expected to be the weaker military power and expected to be on the receiving end of a spanking. And what happened was that, that they used drones, uh, both Turkish and Israeli suicide drones, uh, to great effect against uh, um, Armenian tanks and artillery positions and, and, and radar and that the air defense systems that the Russians had or that, that the Armenians had, which were of Russian origin, were not prepared to fight uh, modern, uh, 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 modern use of drones. And in fact, the Armenian doctrine was kind of a Russian doctrine and, and it didn't work. Uh, I can tell you that, but uh, I think that there are drones coming on now that are even Canadian made uh, that would have a combat capability uh, that would certainly enhance our, our armed forces. I'll hand off the general. General, what are your views? Uh, to answer the question as to what does Canada have armed drones, the answer is no. And uh, that was uh, part of the peace dividend that, uh, that uh, political leadership decided to cash in. Uh, quite frankly, I find that inexcusable because a politician's first duty is to ensure the safety and security of their citizens. We're part of an alliance structure and the cost to actually acquire such, uh, such technology is not very high. Uh, but I think it went against the grain of a variety of governments. So no, we do not have armed drones. Do we need them? Absolutely. We also need big drones uh, or UAVs, unattended aerial vehicles, to surveil not only the Arctic, but not only to surveil, but to be prepared to drop lethal munitions. Because let's not forget that Russia is our neighbor and they abut the Arctic, and, Arctic, and I'm sure they have uh, some ambitions vis-a-vis -vis the Canadian Arctic. We need medium-level drones which should be equipped with lethal munitions to seek out and strike those enemies that we have. Uh, we now have an enemy in Russia. Uh, and should they decide to progress any further in towards NATO, which is not impossible, then it's far better to kill them at a distance and not spend Canadian lives in the first instance to do so. And we need short range drones. Do exactly the same thing that which we see in the Ukraine. By the way, I'm led to believe, as uh, Joe Varner identified, that um, some of the drones that are in use by the Ukraine to very good effect have as their technological root a lot of Canadian content. And I'm also told by some Ukraine friends that Ukraine's been asking Canada to provide those drones for years and we declined to do so. So just think if the Ukraine had had say a thousand of these relatively small relatively cheap drones with which you can destroy armored vehicles, what impact that would have had, just as we've seen on the Azerbaijan experience of, of the not recent past. And who are we to say no to that legitimate request, keeping in mind that weapon systems were requested, you know, after 2014 when Putin had already invaded once. So that, that deserves some exploring. And who was actually involved in that decision to say no? Because that cost Ukraine lives. The next question is for both of you. Uh, what are the implications of this confrontation for NATO and in turn for Canada? Joe? NATO has gone through a long slumber in NATO countries. And I mean, I'll take Germany as a quick example. Merkel's policies of the last 
uh, several years are, you know, now proving to be complete and utter failures. Uh, there was a time that there was a British army of the Rhine and, uh, you know, Britain had a, a lot of combat power and in many ways, probably the, the third or most powerful uh, country on the planet. Um, but economic decline and, and government policy have restricted that. Uh, France, uh, similarly, um, you know, Russia and China have spent a lot of time uh, trying to uh, subvert NATO and subvert the EU, and they've had considerable success. And so NATO was, was not ready, and NATO is just waking up now to having a, a very aggressive Russia on its frontier. And Putin's made it very clear in, in speeches and, and his desire you know, Ukraine is one target, uh, but it's a target-rich environment. He wants the Baltic states back. He wants Georgia. Um, he probably is going to, to deal with Armenia and Azerbaijan and Kazakhstan. Uh, you know, he, he wants Moldova. And, and, you know, I think part of this southern campaign along the Black Sea, you know, I suspect the terminus in the original Russian plan was Moldova. It, it wasn't, uh, you know, right up to the Romanian frontier. So NATO is waking up to a real headache and it's got some real soul searching to do. And it's not just, you know, not just in Europe, this plays out in the Pacific. Hmm. It plays out with an aggressive China in the South China Sea, uh, East China Sea, Taiwan, and on the Indo uh, Chinese border. You know, do we stand for the rules-based order or do we let the Russians and the Chinese roll over us? And and we're at that point. Push has come to shove. For Canada, Canada has been running around under the, the view that for years that it has no natural predators and, and that we had a big dog next door to us that was going to protect us. And now you're looking at the Russians uh, rearming their Arctic because they see it as a vulnerable point. Um, you know, it's a defensive posture, but it's also an aggressive posture. Uh, and you see China looking at Canada's north and, you know, declaring it kind of a golden highway uh, and, and that they're a near Arctic power and looking at the, the Arctic as strategic territory where if they had issues with, uh, with Russia or they had issues with North America, they, they could shower either with, you know, nuclear missiles from under the ice pack. So times have changed. Uh, and and we have to wake up. I mean, we saw the FOBs test by China this summer where they put a ballistic missile uh, up uh, through the southern hemisphere, came up around South America, and then went on a, a northern uh, 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 path. Uh, all NORAD centers or sensors face towards Russia. Uh, North American defense is 360. Time to wake up, time to do uh, do uh, things to protect our own population, our own people. General, same question. The war, Russia's war in Ukraine could easily spiral out of control. Out of control in the sense that it already is out of NATO's control, but it could have global lack of control if Putin resorts to nuclear or chemical weapons as he is threatened to do, should NATO try to impose a no-fly zone with NATO aircraft over Ukrainian soil, uh, or if he attacks the anti-aircraft systems on the Russian on the ground in Ukraine. I think that uh, the peace dividend period has been enjoyed by a variety of Western democracies, uh, as has happened just about every other time in our past. And Funnily enough, the lessons of history, we seem to learn, relearn, and relearn what we learned last time. So if you want peace, you're prepared for war. And you have to have deterrence capability. Otherwise, Putin wouldn't have attacked. He attacked because he thought he could win. And the reason why he thought he could win is he underestimated the will of NATO to congeal, if you would, and become a coherent whole in terms of their appreciation of this threat. At the strategic level, uh, I think the existential threat now posed by Russia and its savage attack on Ukraine 
will have both an immediate effect and a longer term effect on the global order, the global communes, if you will. And I think that we've now relearned the value and the importance of both defense, which is just that, defend, but also deter so that you don't actually hopefully have to get into the fighting portion of a conflict because in the enemy's mind, you've got sufficient strength in the shop window to make it unrealistic for your potential enemy to expect victory, which is the circumstances that we find ourselves dealing with Putin. So do we have to do more? Of course we do. We have to contribute to the defense of Canada through the Canada-US organization of NORAD. And we have to agree, and they've been asking us to do this for about a decade, mm. to do our fair share of the upgrades and the enhancements, and maybe some installation and refurnishing of refurnishing, refurbishment of the applicable uh, NORAD facilities on Canadian soil. We have to get serious right now, no delay, no dithering on defending our Arctic. Like right now. Why? Because the Russians are also eyeing that Arctic and they've proven themselves to be of hostile intent. As I would argue that despite the failure of NATO to adequately assess what was happening with the buildup of the 200,000 Russian troops prior to Putin giving the go, uh, the actual value of NATO is now more important than ever because it shows you what happened if you're not part of NATO, where, you know, bears and who knows what else can go rabid and can attack. And I never thought I'd be talking about, you know, thousands of tanks and armored vehicles lumbering across Europe Ukraine is part of Europe in the year 2022, and here we are. So to the appeasers, to the doubters, to the don't worry about it, he won't do it, folk, uh, you might just want to spend a bit of time soul searching and knock your smugness down, level down a couple of notches, please. Uh, I think the value of NATO then is even more important than ever before, but there's got to be some changes, obviously. And as well as uh, Joe mentioned, the importance of the Indo-Pacific as a potential theater of operations or theater of deterrence uh, should not be underestimated because it's really for Canada and the United States, the growing region in terms of economic development and trade flows. And the last thing you want to do is focus all your attention on the Russian bear and forget about other potential threats or competitors that may emerge. You are going to have to get serious about defense again. And uh, that may irk those who are see themselves as progressive and want to focus on social programs, but it's really hard to be progressive and focus on social programs when a Russian bear is literally ripping your house apart and killing your family. Good point. Uh, question for both of you, uh, and it basically flows from uh, your response, General. What should Canada do to enhance our military capabilities, our reserve and regular forces, to address sovereignty issues and our NORAD NATO alliance responsibilities. Joe, over to you. I guess for my, my you know, if I was to pick priorities, I would say let's get F-35. The competition, we all know, has been scored. We all know that there's a winner. Germany was dead set against F-35, just bought 35 of them. Uh, Finland, Sweden's nearest neighbor and closest trading partner, just bought F-35. So, you know, time to get on with it. We need a fifth generation fighter. And you're either best in the air and best on the water or you're dead. You know, you can, there's tactical finesse in terms of the army. You can do a lot with parity. But if you're not, you know, the best in the air and best on sea, you're dead. Uh, we need new surface warships and we need them now. Um, and I, I think there are considerable problems with the current program. We need drones, as the general said. We need new submarines because our Victoria class are not able to defend the Arctic, and we need modern icebreakers up there. I think you can expand the Rangers. You could set up a permanent reserve uh, unit in our north and rearm and, and retrain the Rangers and actually give them incentives to be Rangers. Uh, uh, general Semyonov had, had a lot to say about this just recently in the – Standing Committee on National Defense. 
So there's a lot of things that we can do, but F-35s and surface warships are at the top of the list in my mind. Uh, growing our reserve and getting our military back up to strength. We're 10,000, 11,000 short. You know, no trade is manned at over 85%. Infantry battalions, I'm told, are down to 250, 300 men and women. Uh, you know, we've got some serious, serious work to do. General, same question. I would say um, I will break it into short term um, with some specific recommendations and then uh, medium term. So in the short term, the Canadian Armed Forces needs uh, an immediate injection of funding to address such issues as uh, funds for military training to increase the readiness of all elements, something that uh, the CDS and the heads of the Army, Navy and Air Force have expressed quite a large degree of dismay over in terms of not being as ready as they should be because they didn't have the resources. And of course, what is readiness? How do you actualize that? Well, that includes spare parts for ships and tanks and guns and vehicles and helicopters and planes and submarines, fuel, ammunition, uh, infrastructure upgrades to make training more effective and efficient. And of course, the instructional cadre, which has been solely thinned out. Another large injection of funds immediate to bring the Canadian Armed Forces not only up to the strength that uh, the strength deficit that Joe is referring to, where we're about 10,000 uniformed people short, um, but uh, further funds to augment the reserves. So take them from where they are now, but increase that number. And uh, probably a package of somewhere in the order of 10,000 subdivided between a few, few regulars, large number of reservists and the associated public servants who you know, do the administrative tasks more effectively and more cheaply than, it, than having a uniform person do that. Specific purchases, we desperately need handheld anti-tank systems and I'll throw in specific ones because you've all seen them on two, perhaps like Javelin, we need them right now. We need um, a longer range anti-tank and anti-armor vehicle systems such as Spike. Uh, we need, um, we don't have any air defense, so please, that's been on the minister's desk for 15 years now. Short range hand, anti aircraft systems such as Stinger, uh, which a lot of nations are contributing to, uh, to the Ukraine with good effect. A medium system anti aircraft, uh, ground based, uh, medium to long, perhaps the uh, Iron Dome, the Israeli Iron Dome. We already have the radars. We bought three of the radars for target acquisition, so it's just really getting the shooters now. Uh, a variety of arc arc Arctic focused vehicles, much akin to the old BB 206, but whatever the more contemporary fleets and suites might be. Long range precision strike so that you can defend um, and reach out over significant ranges, um, perhaps some based in the Arctic, uh, some, of course, deployed wherever our troops may go uh, so that we don't actually have to. Um, to be, you know, we can minimize the rather sh brutal short range uh, activities to the extent possible. An integrated family of armed, note armed, uh, drones, UAVs from small to very large. The very large ones, of course, for, focused on the Arctic uh, with high endurance. And there's a couple of, of there on the commercial market, but you know, right now, uh, not, not five years from now, not 10 years from now. And, there's thousands of ancillary support contracts and projects and for training capabilities and bits and pieces. Um, some big strategic decisions that should have been made years ago, at least seven or eight years ago. And for whatever reason, uh, the current government uh, just sort of fiddled while Rome burned. A decision on new fighters. I agree entirely with Joe. I like no rush, but tomorrow would be good. Keeping in mind it's years before they can be delivered. A uh, decision on new surface combatants, which have that pro program has been languishing for half of my military career. Uh, a decision on new um, maritime patrol aircraft, which I would submit there's a variety of very good choices out there that are proven. We don't have to buy something brand new, please, but proven, mature, with all the right electronics and ability to find submarines and to kill them. Right? It's not just, hey, I found a submarine down there because you have to be prepared for a war. And we've seen what happens when you're not. 
And um, I agree with uh, my distinguished colleague. It's not only, not only do you need to see uh, what's happening up in the Arctic, but you've got to see what's happening under the ice. You've got to hear it. You've got to understand it. You've got to be able to, to act on it should it come to the worst case, because that's part of deterrence. So we need submarines that can operate under the Arctic and have ranges of thousands of kilometers, because that's the size of that magnificent piece of, of terrain and, uh, and uh, seascape. And it's got to be able to hunt and kill submarines because deterrence means you have to be able to put in the opponent's mind the idea that you're going to fight, that their opponent's going to fight and win to defeat them. That did not happen with NATO when Putin amassed his 200,000 troops and decided to attack the Ukraine. Sorry, it was a rather, rather long-winded list that just points to the urgency of some of the decisions that this government's going to have to make, uh, which have been long postponed and often denied. Uh, both of you noted uh, the lack of uh, numbers uh, in the Canadian forces. And it would appear, at least from the sources that I've chatted to, that uh, essentially we do not own the Army, Navy, and Air Force, do not own the recruiting program and processes, nor do we really own the training system, uh, that, which was so important in the follow-on. So the pipeline has been very problematic with some people that I've chatted to taking up to two years to go into recruiting. And then their follow on training has basically been minimized in some cases or been delayed in part as these individuals uh, aspire to become uh, forces members. Um, can you make contact, uh, comment on that, Joe? I guess from my perspective, our recruiting system is, is, is broken. Uh, and I, I don't know what else to say. It was problematic back in the day when we were in government and was a major concern. And I think we made them try and fix it. Uh, but, you know, we, we did not succeed. And, and right now you're, you're seeing it play out under, under this government and the situation's no better. And in fact, I think it's worse. When General Leslie, uh, had the Canadian Army, we had 3,000 more uh, infantry uh, than we were supposed to have on the books. Uh, but we had all those trained people um, ready to go and do do uh, business and defend the country and support the country's foreign policy objectives. And what you're seeing now is a hollow military that's a problem, I think, rejuvenating itself. I mean, we're, 100 and, we're supposed to have 150 uh, fighter pilots in the Air Force uh, to train and fight and rejuvenate the Air Force. We've got 47. So at that level, uh, you know, can you can you bring things back? And I'm not sure that you can. And without outside help. And so I think it's 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 very much a concern how this has been allowed and you know the flip side of the coin of, of recruitment is retention and what are we doing to hold on to people and what are we doing to invite people back that we otherwise you know let go of just maybe a little too early you know i i, I don't have any magic answers but 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 that's my view it's 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 um, you know if if we're we're we, we've got problems with infrastructure we've got problems with equipment uh, we've got problems with leadership at the senior political level, um, and and we've got problems with personnel. <clears throat> we can't take people in fast enough, and uh, we don't seem to hold on to them. I know one individual that spent five years trying to uh, get into the CIC, which is our, our cadet organization, and uh, with the highest of recommendations, and every time he got close, his, his um, application timed out. And if we can't get in cadet instructors, uh, you know, how are we going to get in infantry officers and pilots and Mars officers and lawyers and doctors and cyber warfare experts? General, uh, if I may, uh, this recruiting situation has been problematic for both the reserves and the regulars for quite some time. How would you address this recruiting and training pipeline, which has been problematic essentially for 30 years now? 
Yeah, if I could, Paul, I'll start at the strategic level and uh, bring it down to the recruiting system. Um, I had the fortune to lead the Army, the Canadian Army Regular Reserve for four years and a bit, the height of the Afghan war. And so I developed a thesis, which this is all about leadership. And I'll tell you where the leadership starts. It starts in the prime minister's office. And if the prime minister does not want to support the funds that the armed forces needs to deliver the outcome that the armed forces needs as articulated to the political staffs through the various cycles and reports and programs, then not much happens. And as time progresses and people decide to cash in a peace dividend, um, it's very easy not to say yes to a defense expenditure. So notice my use of language. A lot of old people will quite proudly say, hey, I, I never said no to that program. Yeah, but you had to, you know, you're one of a thousand people that had to sign off in the documents to get it approved. So as you get further from the sound of the guns, the complexity of the administrative paradigm increases. And if you don't really want to spend the money, then you don't really care that much about levels of bureaucracy, each of which can have a quiet veto on a project, not by saying no, but by never saying yes. Kind of like, you know, sending weapons to Ukraine in the five years prior to the outbreak of hostility by Russia. Ukraine's asked for all sorts of things from us. And no one ever said yes. Oh, we never said no. Well, you know what? That doesn't cut it. That's disingenuous. That's misleading Canadians. So now let's talk about our issue. In my experience, uh, across two governments as army commander, uh, with two prime ministers that probably didn't start their tenures as prime minister wanting to be deeply involved in military activities, but ended up doing so. One was Prime Minister Martin, and the Minister of National Defense, I had two, were um, uh, John McCallum and Bill Grant. And do you know what? I, as the Army commander, could go into their office, the concurrence of the CDS, and say, here's what I need. I need your help in getting it. And within a matter of days or weeks, for the initial mission to Kabul, which I commanded, uh, radars were bought, guns were acquired, night vision goggles. Not hugely complicated things to do, but it still set a precedent. Fast forward, changing government. Prime Minister Harper comes into power. Peter McKay's my minister. Same sort of relationship, except for now the stakes were bigger because we had more troops in Afghanistan. We were fighting in Kandahar. Well, I could go into the minister's office and say, hey, I'm having problems getting the tank program through or whatever. And we ended up buying, in a matter of months, a whole new fleet of tanks. Mm -hmm. In a matter of a couple of weeks, a whole suite of new weapon systems for the infantry, new equipment to carry loads, new helmets, and the list goes on. In a matter of weeks, new heavy guns for the artillery. In a matter of months, new helicopters, enormous helicopters, Chinooks. Yeah. In a matter of a couple of months, integrated fire control systems for aircraft and the interaction to bring them in on target. And you're fighting for your life in the pantry. I could go on with other examples of how this can work, but this all comes down to a very small group of people. In my case, it was the ministers I just mentioned. Uh, by the way, for example, Rona Ambrose was invaluable as in, in, when she was a minister because she understood the need. And once again, she, she'd say, General, we haven't talked in two weeks. Come on over and let me know I can help. And she'd gather her senior deputies and, and assistant deputy ministers there and there was no, well, you know, you know, we're having a problem. This is taking too long. And the, the, that laser, laser glare would go out on, on some poor deputies sort of noggin. And there'd be action pretty quickly after. You, you got to pull, you got to pull defense capability through the system. Because the system right now is designed and it's been designed that way by, by cheerful ignorance from ministers who weren't paying enough attention to their portfolio, not the ones I talked about. Uh, or by design because they didn't want to spend the money. So let's talk about recruiting. Um, when resources are constrained, 
and you got budget cuts on the horizon, people are always trying to find efficiencies. And as well, every five or six years, some bright young man or woman comes along and says, hey, I've got a better way to do this. I've got a revolutionary new idea where we'll save money and we'll increase the output and we'll make the recruit better and more rounded and it'll be more whatever. If you have sufficient money and sufficient resources, because resources aren't only money, it's people and facilities and you know, the training tools and the equipment, um, then the actual service chiefs are very good at what they do and they can get on with it. The more you centralize, the more difficult it is for the people who actually have to fight to get the output from the system that they need. Mm -hmm. That that's almost a law in a variety of militaries and militaries are not, I mean, the military is a very old profession. I won't get into an argument, which, which one is oldest, but it's a very old profession. And there's a good reason why certain things happen in a military way and creating large bureaucracies to essentially try to find efficiencies uh, while cutting around the margins of systems that are very complicated and don't respond well to change results in the sort of choking of the recruiting pipeline right now. But also, I would argue that there's a bunch of folk who have been looking at the armed forces after the last five or six years saying, so all I hear on the news is budget cuts and broken equipment and, you know, leaders who have uh, demonstrated appalling behavioral patterns and who are abusing their power and engaging in misogyny or, or even rape and, and it, oh my goodness. So there's no doubt there had to be a culture change. Got it, long overdue. Mind you, look what just happened. So all these sorts of things I've mentioned are important, but my final message to you is, we need an armed forces that can fight and can win. And if you don't have an armed forces that has the equipment and the people and the training to fight and win, then look out. Because the world's a lot more dangerous today than it was yesterday. Um, we both, uh, it, both of you gentlemen have uh, underlined uh, that uh, Canada's uh, uh, observations, if you will, uh, of what is happening in the Ukraine has basically resurfaced uh, some of Canada's off, uh, Arctic sovereignty issues with Russia. Uh, I'd like to return to that question. What should Canada do to address this in the short and long terms? Joe, your view, please. Well, in the short term, I, I, I'm going to go back to some of the things I've originally said. Right now, we need an F-35 that can engage in 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 uh, our airspace and outside our airspace and engage uh, independent of other systems, if if need be. Uh, that would be key right now to to uh, part of our NORAD defenses and part of our ability to cover the Arctic. I think there is room to grow our, our Ranger program to re-equip them, re-incentivize them, give them better training, to get more eyes out there. And I think it would be good to have a permanent reserve force presence in the North, uh, spread out among the, the territorial and provincial uh, capitals uh, that, that would form uh, you know, the basis uh, of, a, of a military organization up there. Uh, right now, you know, we've been at, at alert for how many years? Mm. Uh, permanent runways, we need uh, better, you know, some of our runways are in pretty bad shape and we need more of them to get better coverage or forward runways. Um, Nana Civic, we have to get that port up and running. Our command center should be manned all the time up there, uh, not just part time or ready when we we need people to step in. And I mean, I think with NORAD modernization, the country is sooner or later going to have to take a very serious look at joining missile defense, mm. um, and that that that's going to be part of it. But you know, we need a constellation of sensors from the sea bottom uh, to space. And we need it 360. Uh, and 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 I don't think that that the government has has got that yet. I don't think that they really understand the problem. 
I think a lot of the governments come out of out of uh, a lot of the staff and a lot of the people have a very provincial understanding of national security and international affairs. And they've demonstrated it time and time again. I don't think they take it particularly seriously. And I think now they have to. But what I would say is, given the events this morning and the announcement by the Prime Minister that, that the NDP was going to keep the government in power for the next year or so, I now have concerns about proclamations that we're going to, you know, increase our defense spending um, and shoot for the 2% goal and, uh, you know, you know, modernize NORAD. The NDP has long been on record as opposing defense spending, opposing NATO and opposing NORAD. General, your views on this? I'm the eternal optimist. I believe that uh, what Putin and uh, his, his immediate thugs that surround him, which are large in number, um, have and will serve as a wake-up call to even the most hardened of uh, optimists uh, and uh, appeasers. And I understand the desire not to wait resort, waste resources on capabilities that some people feel may never be used. Because you don't really need a tank or a submarine or a maritime patrol aircraft until you really need one. <laughs> and then you can't wait five or 10 years to have it built and then sent off to do its job. So it does re represent a big investment. So you have to then start thinking about, well, what happens if we don't do it? And unfortunately, there's all sorts of pressures to allow those, well, you don't need this thing anymore, whatever this might be. Um, and that's how you create the circumstances for people such as Putin to do the horrific acts that he's currently doing. So I believe that we will invest more. And if we don't, then that's a confidence measure with which the people of Canada should be assessing their political leadership. And yes, I, I saw about the, co uh, not the coalition, uh, the alliance, I guess, between the NDP and the uh, Liberals, I understood. Um, until 2024, I believe the time frame. Uh, the Russian bear is not going away, no matter what happens with Putin, no matter what happens with the current tragic fight in Ukraine, the world's order, I think, has changed somewhat. But the power relationships have definitely changed. And you can see sort of the vague outlines of two camps starting to emerge. Those who are more dictatorial and less concerned about the international rule of law or human rights or the idea of the progressive agenda, which includes a variety of nations, not only Russia. So prepare for peace by preparing for war. If we don't have that deterrence capability, then wars are fought. That's the, the most important, I think, and tragic message of what's happening with Ukraine. We weren't ready, we NATO. Our political and military systems were not ready. And military systems and democracies do what the political masters tell them to do. We've spent seven or 800 billion in the last, what, 20 months on a variety of issues surrounding COVID, but much more than that. A lot of social programs, which are great, but Right now, the president of Ukraine wants stingers and javelins and air defense systems. He's not asking for any social programs right now. And on that note, sir, I, I, I'm going to have to leave very shortly, so I will turn the final word over to you. Well, gentlemen, on behalf of Samuel Associates and the Policy Insights Forum, thank you for your valuable insights uh, to the regional and, and global security uh, threat that we've had since the, essentially the Cold War. So thank you both for uh, assisting Policy Insights Forum and uh, providing 
your insights and commentary on uh, this ongoing uh, threat and war in Ukraine. Thank you again, gentlemen. Thank you.